talk will be Veronica Galvan. She's an associate professor at the Cellular Integrative Physiology at the Barshop Institute for Longevity and Aging Studies in San Antonio. Um, she had some trouble with the flight, but she was uh, strong and she managed to, to, to reach medicine. And she was going to give us a, a very interesting talk, a mechanism of linking aging to Alzheimer's disease, I believe, with a strong mTOR and metabolic. Uh, metabolic uh, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Luigi, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here uh, today. And what I'm going to do first is discuss some of the background and how uh, background information and how we uh, combine that with our hypothesis and with the data as, as we generated in the lab and how all of this forms a framework that we go back to that guides um, the direction of our research. So uh, vascular dysfunction increases with aging, and this is a universal feature of aging. Um, so there's general consensus that this, uh, um, uh, the, this uh, dysfunction um, has a, a center um, or, or an, uh, an initiating um, dysfunction, and that um, is related to endothelial dependent a vasodilation, a failure of endothelium dependent vasodilation. So we'll uh, go back to this notion uh, during my talk. And I would also like to remind you that a few years ago, a breakthrough was, um, came about in the field of aging by which uh, the first demonstration of a gene, a particular um, um, uh, protein, this is a kinase, um, the target of rapamycin, was involved, it was demonstrated that this um, uh, protein is involved in the regulation of aging in mammals, uh, more precisely in mice. So this was well known in vertebrates, but uh, it was only until 2009 that this was discovered. And so this opened up a number of possibilities, and, and, and one is the goal of my lab, and that is to figure out how is it that aging contributes mechanistically to the pathogenesis of different, different diseases, and what we focus on is our diseases of brain with a, with a major emphasis on Alzheimer's disease. So in the field, and we also share this hypothesis, is that even though TOR does many, many things, uh, there, there, there are a discrete set of uh, TOR functions that promote aging, and those um, can be uh, essentially um, identified and figured out. And uh, we further propose that this is true for the brain, and we would like to uh, hypothesize on the basis of our data that vascular dysfunction, cerebrovascular dysfunction, is one of the store dependent aging factors in the brain, as well as synaptic dysfunction. I will not show you um, data um, on synaptic dysfunction today. We will briefly touch upon the neuronal aspects of TOR action, um, because most of the, the bulk of, of our uh, data um, in the last years was on, on cerebrovascular function. So we care about Alzheimer's disease because of its cognitive um, effects. And so we wanted to ask the question early on as to whether if we use an intervention as toward attenuation to delay the process of aging in mice, would we delay uh, the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease? The answer is yes. And what I'm showing you here is just the, um, the results from the latest experiment that we performed in animals at very, very late stages of Alzheimer's-like disease. These animals were about 25 to 27 months of age. And as you can see here, there's profound defects in uh, recognition memory in animals that are untreated as compared to their non-transgenic litter mates. However, animals that were treated with rapamycin in which TOR was attenuated chronically are indistinguishable from non-transgenic uh, wild-type mice. These experiments are only the last of a number of studies by our laboratories and other laboratories and that have tested this idea in more than four different mouse models of Alzheimer's. So, but what, we're, what we were doing here and in many of those studies is to use a drug and so essentially we are attenuating TOR not only in every cell type of the brain but in every cell type of the body as well. So we wanted to uh, hone down and essentially start to narrow down the roles of different cell cellular uh, types in the brain. 
And so uh, we, we use genetic tools to, um, uh, if you allow me, to uh, give rapamycin just to neurons. Uh, you do allow me, I'm glad. <laughs> so give rapamycin just to neurons just by doing a combination of you, the use of uh, uh, Cree log speak recombination and, and inducible promoters. So this is the work of a postdoctoral fellow, a senior postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Stacy Husang. And what she did was to generate animals in which uh, there's three um, uh, doses, so groups of animals where you can find 100% um, 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 uh, formation of complex one. So this is specific for complex one because we used a flux raptor allele. This is a obligatory component of complex one. So 100% um, complex one formation full activity or animals in which this was reduced by 35% or further by 60%. So um, our first question was, are we um, affecting cognitive function? And this is just spatial learning that I'm showing here. Uh, not during initial training, which is rather simple for uh, animals that are not um, deceased in any way. Uh, however, when we pushed them uh, to, to with, a, with a more difficult task, the 60% uh, animals revealed a uh, um, um, uh, delay in learning that was not a complete impairment because they could reach consensus. Now, the surprise came when we looked at their ability to retain and remember this information. And as you can see here, these are, are two different um, analyses done on the same data. The animals in which um, tor complex one formation is reduced by, by 30, about 35%, which by the way is roughly the degree of reduction in, in tor activity that we see with rapamycin administration and mimics it fairly well. Uh, these animals have enhanced retention. So <clears throat> essentially they have enhanced memory and, and therefore this is an instance of enhanced cognitive function. And these are healthy animals. Uh, again, these are wild type animals. So uh, we wanted to make sure that this was not idiosyncratic to the water maze. And so we used a completely different task in this case, uh, a test that allows us to test uh, recognition memory. And so what you can see here is that again, the 35% knockdown. Uh, and this is again, only in neurons and only during adulthood. So this is very sp exquisitely specific for neurons. And it starts at 2.5 months of age. So, um, so ha having, um, um, uh, noticed this, we uh, uh, realized that this was consistent with uh, uh, studies that uh, Dr. Eileen Ling, who was in our um, institution at that time, had done on a cohort of very old rats that we um, worked on in collaboration with Steve Austin. So these are animals at 36 months of age approximately, and as you can see here, this is functional MRI. So the, our results were consistent with this improvement in network activation that you can see with a functional uh, imaging um, uh, tool. Uh, and, and this um, essentially reflects a profound deficit that is observed in older rats, um, very old rats, that um, essentially this is, a, this is a deficit in network activation, a blunting of the response to somatosensory stimulation that is completely restored essentially to levels non-distinguishable from those of younger animals by uh, chronic rapamycin treatment. This again uh, was um, confirmed by another set of data with functional imaging, in this case is glucose PET. This is data uh, also generated by a link where she found that consistent with the phenotypes, the cognitive phenotypes that we observed, glucose uh, metabolism in brain of 35% knockdown animals is enhanced and increased with regards to control. And the 60% knockdowns are, um, are um, impaired and have decreased glucose metabolism. So this data um, taken together, this data told us that there is not, the, the relationship between complex one formation and memory is not linear. And there is actually a sweet spot at, at, a, at a dose that is slightly less of that of wild type animals. However, if we keep uh, reducing the dose of uh, complex one, then this becomes deleterious and essentially is consistent with prior studies that show that acute inhibition of Tourette synapses 
blocks LTP, and also some data that was uh, collected from knockouts in the pathway. The same is true for increasing doses of complex one formation or activity, and that is consistent with uh, phenotypes of hyperactive TOR in TSC1, TSC2 knockouts, and other knockouts in which TOR is hyperactive, where there is cognitive impairment. So um, we, we thought that this essentially had to, um, this report on, on neuronal network, network function, but neuronal networks don't uh, work in the void. They need to be associated with vasculature to be able to um, uh, produce and be the substrates for function. So the uh, um, vasculature is intimately involved in providing nutrients and energy, and that is the basis for fMRI. Uh, this is just a rem you know, remem uh, to remind you of the data that we just discussed. So we decided to look at vascular function and um, I-Ling um, performed some studies of cerebral blood flow where uh, she looked at um, overall cerebral blood flow levels in animals that um, had a model Alzheimer's disease that had or not been treated with rapamycin. As you can see here, profound differences in cerebral blood flow uh, were to completely restored again to uh, wild type um, uh, unaffected levels by chronic rapamycin treatment. I link um, determined that this is not related to changes in metabolism. This is with glucose PET. But actually that the variance that you see here in the data can be completely explained by a loss and a restoration of vascular density. So that most likely the explanation, mechanistic explanation for this maintenance of cerebral blood flow is the preservation of those uh, vascular uh, capillary networks and, and essentially the integrity of the vasculature to support perfusion. So, um, because we were very interested in this, because um, in the context of an Alzheimer's disease model, there's, there's high amounts of amyloid beta being produced, and amyloid beta is known to be a lethal insult to the vasculature in certain circumstances. So we looked to see whether those differences that we saw were associated with differences in, in vascular accumulation of amyloid. And as you can see here, there's um, the red is the amyloid and the green structure is, is a, a, a microvascular element. And you can see that there's substantial amounts of amyloid that are uh, co-localizing and depositing on this microvascular element. And that is completely, um, uh, not completely abolished, but substantially decreased by uh, treatment with rapamycin. And this is also accompanied by an overall reduction in A-beta. And, and therefore, the two uh, processes are happening together. We were able to validate this data in a second mouse model. This is a much more aggressive model in which the position of fibrillar amyloid occurs very uh, widespread in the, in the vasculature. And again, um, the results indicated that um, animals in which TOR is attenuated have much less deposition. Um, an aspect of amyloid biology that you may or may not have heard about is that uh, it is cleared um, about between 80 and 90 percent of amyloid is cleared from the brain through the vasculature by, by mechanisms that are highly regulated. So uh, the vasculature works as a sink, essentially clearing amyloid that is continuously being produced in, in perfectly healthy um, uh, brains throughout our, life, our lifetimes. And so <coughs> we thought uh, the preservation of vasculature and the low levels of amyloid suggests that this clearance mechanism is being preserved. So we were fortunate to establish a collaboration with John Cirrito, Washington University, who developed a method to, to measure directly levels of amyloid by, um, in, in, in uh, behaving animals by, um, um, uh, by inserting microprobes and uh, doing microdialysis. So with these experiments, um, John showed that um, basal levels of amyloid in, in brains of animals treated with rapamycin are lower. And that once we block the production of new amyloid and we follow the disappearance of amyloid from the interstitium, um, the, the, the rate uh, at which a beta is clear from the brain, so the, half, the, the inverse of the half-life in brain, um, is increased, therefore the half-life is reduced. Essentially, the reduced half-life indicates that the amyloid is being cleared out. And this is a direct measure of clearance, so essentially this data confirmed our hypothesis that this was related to, uh, to, uh, to the preservation of the vasculature, uh, most likely, although there are other factors. 
So um, at this point, we thought, OK, uh, we're using an intervention that is expected to delay aging in, in mice. And so um, thinking very uh, simplistically, we did uh, another very uh, sophisticated experiment, which was to just directly measure whether um, tor attenuation may be affecting that initial injury that we talked about at the beginning of my talk at the level of endothelium. So basically that apical injury uh, during aging um, that is universal in, in, uh, with regards to endothelium dependent vasodilation, we thought is it possible that TOR is actually regulating that? And so we used two photon microscopy to um, look at um, vasodilation as a result of TOR attenuation. And these are acute experiments. So the animals were uh, injected with doses of uh, rapamycin or vehicle, and they were looked at while they were alive through a uh, two photon microscope that allows you to ex examine what's going on dynamically in, their, in the um, um, uh, superficial layers of the, of the cortex in, in that vasculature. So what you can see here in this graph here um, is that a tor attenuation, acute tor attenuation results in vasodilation that is consistent with the activity of a very known and potent um, vasodilator that is acetylcholine. So it's lower in magnitude, so the potency is not that high, but this is consistent with other bona fide vasodilators. And if, um, if it uh, was acting through a nitric oxide dependent pathway, we wanted to find out whether that was the case. So we looked at, we used a probe that uh, will fluoresce in, in, in contact with nitric oxide. And so this is representative of of many um, imaging experiments where you can see that uh, release of nitric oxide as green signal here precedes the local vasodilation of that segment of the microvasculature. So we further characterize that uh, biochemically. Um, this is following the kinetics and comparing it to that of acetylcholine to make sure that this was uh, using the same type of mechanisms. And we were able also to abolish, I don't have those data, abolish completely the response by a not nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. So uh, furthermore, an important aspect of vascular aging is the loss of, vas of, of uh, vascular reactivity. So uh, we measure directly vascular reactivity using acetylcholine, th this time in animals that have been chronically treated with rapamycin. And so what we're coming in with is acetylcholine, and we're measuring the ability of that vasculature to respond to this um, uh, stimulus. And so this uh, was done in the uh, model that has extensive vascular fibrillar deposition where we can um, separately analyze um, vascular elements that are devoid of amyloid and those that are heavily um, uh, loaded with it. And I will call your attention to this side of the panel where uh, segments that are devoid of amyloid in transgenic animals are analyzed separate from those that, that, um, that have a heavy load. And how um, in, in animals that have been treated with rapamycin, the response to acetylcholine is potentiated not only, so it's, it's present not only in the segments that are devoid of amyloid, but also they, uh, essentially the treatment rescues a profound deficit that is observed in uh, segments that are heavily loaded with amyloid. So uh, at this point, um, we um, um, had essentially evidence, strong evidence for an action of tor attenuation that is very um, immediate, acute, and that hap is happening acutely. But also we had very strong evidence for vascular effects of tor attenuation in the chronic, in the long term, in the chronic, in the chronic condition and the maintenance of cerebral blood flow and now in the maintenance of uh, vascular reactivity. So we decided, we, we thought, okay, it's, uh, it's likely or it's, a, it's, it's, it's reasonable to think that these the two processes are linked mechanistically together. To actually answer that question or to ask that question, we did again a rather simple experiment we took the same design that we, were, we had used for our other cerebral blood flow studies. And so at the end of treatment in the last month, we randomized the animals in the rapamycin treatment uh, group to two separate groups. Uh, some animals that would receive just VECO and some animals that would receive uh, an inhibitor of nitric oxide synthesis asking, if we take that aspect of TOR uh, attenuation action away, are we going to uh, change whether rapamycin uh, can or cannot uh, restore cerebral blood flow and maintain cerebral blood flow? So 
uh, these are the results of that experiment. And as you can see, um, these profound deficits are restored, were restored by rapamycin treatment in this cohort. Uh, however, if the animals were treated with a general inhibitor of nitric oxide synthesis, uh, and this was twice a week for, for four weeks, the effect, so this restoration was completely abolished. So this was not the nicest experiment because the inhibitor is not specific. And uh, we're now doing experiments with genetic tools and, and other approaches that are going to give us better, uh, a better grasp on these mechanisms. But it suggests, its data suggests that there is a mechanistic link, that essentially uh, there, is a, there is a requirement for acute vascular um, vasodilation act, act, actions of TOR attenuation directly at the vasculature every day acutely to maintain vascular density and, and, and cerebral blood flow in the long term across many months of the lifespan of these animals. So if this was truly, um, uh, we thought if, if we're really working with a mechanism and we're really um, investigating a mechanism that is involved in, in um, the um, 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 aspects of aging that make a brain vulnerable, that contribute mechanistically to um, uh, the uh, vulnerability of this brain to many specific diseases of aging, then we should be able, or it would be worth asking the question of whether we can see the same in other unrelated models of age-associated dementias. And so we, we were fortunate to establish a collaboration with Dr. Rito Asmis, who uh, had and uses uh, the LDL receptor knockout mouse model, a model of atherosclerosis, and we found that um, TOR uh, attenuation indeed had exactly the same effect on these animals and restored um, cognitive deficits that in this case are associated with atherosclerosis. And as you can see here, this was um, irrespective of the type of diet. These animals are fed control or high fat diet. In both cases, we had a complete restoration of cerebral blood flow by tor attenuation. And this was also true in the cohort of rats that I was showing you some functional MRI data um, before. Uh, in these very old rats, and here is a model of pure aging. So if we are really addressing and looking at the mechanism that is, in, that is related to aging per se, then uh, we should be able to uh, see a similar effect, and that's the case. So in these very, very old rats, we see a restoration of cerebral blood flow um, and that uh, makes these animals, very old animals, indistinguishable from, from younger uh, individuals. So at this point, we wanted to, um, or you know, in parallel with these experiments, we wanted to know how this, you know, how does this work? What are the mechanisms at the cellular level? And so uh, Stacy Husang in my lab established a system where she can model different conditions of uh, wall shear stress in vitro. And uh, this is just to um, show you uh, how different conditions of uh, flow will create different conditions of wall shear stress in vasculature that have very, um, in, very important consequences for the metabolism of those regions of the vasculature, but also, and that's true in brain as well, but also with regards to endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which was our first um, um, uh, target or our first hypothesized target for, for TOR. What she found is that um, Enos, which is um, more active, is expected to be more active in conditions of high wall shear stress uh, in, in comparison to low wall shear stress. If you inhibit uh, TOR, this essentially unmasks Enos activity and, and the low wall shear stress segment, um, sorry, situation, um, and those cells are going to activate Enos uh, comparably to those that are subject to high wall shear stress. So she uh, showed here that this is the degree of inactivation. Um, this dose of rapamycin that we used is exactly or, or very close to the dose that is measured in blood is five nanomolar, so it's a rather low dose. Uh, so Stacy first hypothesized that uh, perhaps what TOR uh, attenuation is doing is enabling phospho, um, sorry, activated AKT to activate Enos. This is one of the kinases that uh, performs the last step of activation of Enos by phosphorylation. And what she found is that it was exactly the opposite, actually. Uh, whenever um, AKT was inactivated by a, an, an inhibitor that was very effective, as you can see here, 
um, the activity of Venus actually was potentiated and these are, we are measuring here fold induction now so it, it really, really goes very high. So obviously AKT is not the kinase that is activating in us. And what Stacy is working now is with a hypothesis that is actually AMPK, which is also active, um, uh, responsible, is one of the kinases that can activate ENOS. Uh, so she uh, looked at AMPK activation. It seems to parallel the activation of ENOS with in, in conditions of mTOR um, attenuation. So uh, what she's working with now is a model in which rapamycin relieves mTOR mediated inhibition of, of AMPK and this has revealed a feedback pathway that uh, was not known as far as we know before and this allows AMPK to then phosphorylate ENOS to uh, a higher degree. So uh, with that I would like to summarize uh, what I've shown you today and some of, I'm going to mention some data that I didn't have time to, uh, to discuss with you today. Uh, so uh, when, when we um, um, attenuate TOR activity, um, we are relieving TOR mediated inhibition of proteostatic mechanisms. We have published uh, studies with regards to um, the role of uh, TOR attenuation in the activation of autophagy as well as the chaperone response as well as other laboratories um, have, have confirmed this. And overall, these results in lower levels of amyloid that are generated um, and, and essentially a, a lowering of the levels of amyloid in, in parenchyma in the interstitium. At the same time, um, our data suggests that attenuating TOR relieves TOR-dependent uh, inhibition of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, potentially through AMPK relief, and that this is mechanistically um, related to the long-term maintenance of cerebral blood flow and vascular density and we saw that these two processes are mechanistically linked by vascular clearance of a beta from the brain. So you have here a feed forward, forward loop of beneficial action that would be established by lowering the levels of production and increasing or maintaining the levels of clearance of amyloid from the interstitium. At the same time, and this I didn't have time to show you today, there's other aspects of endothelial cell function that are affected uh, positively by attenuation of TOR, and one of them is the maintenance of blood-brain barrier, um, and that is through uh, inhibition of mTOR-mediated MMP9 activation. So taken together, we hypothesize that it is the concomitant and, and, and uh, the uh, activation of these pathways in parallel that, that converge to preserve cognitive function, and we would like to propose that mTOR activity links the control of aging, of brain aging, to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's and potentially other dementias by promoting neuronal network dysfunction and cerebrovascular uh, defects associated with, um, with aging. So we hope that we're starting um, to look at the time when we don't look or we don't think about aging as some kind of like black box that is uh, inscrutable and, and, and non-addressable. Now we have ways to look at mechanism. And so we hope that we can start replacing this by um, more detailed, a more detailed understanding of uh, at least some of those pathways. And, and every time that um, you know, we think about uh, this, uh, what we're doing, I get this sensation that it's so little and, and you know, we're going so slowly. But it's, um, it's the beginning, or really this is the tip of the iceberg, and we're, we're hoping that we can replace that you know, general black box with some more information that will, uh, I believe, will significantly increase the, um, our, our uh, capacity to um, identify um, new interventions and essentially uh, open up a wealth of uh, knowledge that we can use to treat Alzheimer's and potentially other diseases. So with that, I would like to thank the people that did uh, this uh, work and uh, people in my lab, uh, present and past members of the lab, our uh, collaborators and our sources of funding. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>